All right. Well, as you know, we had a very violent weekend. I know the mayor gave you an overview uh, yesterday. Uh, we've presented you with a uh, overview in terms of data, numbers of casualties, perspective over the last several years. So uh, I'm happy to answer some uh, general questions while I'm here. Chief, some of these shootings and homicides happened in what we would normally perceive to be good neighborhoods that had manicured lawns and were relatively safe. The uh, neighborhood where the eight-year-old boy was shot apparently near the playground or on the playground. What can be done? Well, one of the things that uh, is uh, striking about this last weekend is how disconnected these many shootings are. Um, we had a total of uh, 15 non-fatal shootings. Four of those shootings had uh, two victims and uh, four homicides. And what we did ascertain is that of all the suspects we've arrested, and we've arrested uh, all four homicide suspects, uh, three of them have extensive arrest records. And of the uh, five non-fatal shooting suspects we've identified or arrested, all of them have significant arrest records. Um, as a matter of fact, when we look at the total number of victims and offenders together this last weekend, there's 150 arrests in that population. Obviously, the two children are not involved in that, and uh, one of the uh, homicide suspects is not involved in that. But overwhelmingly, what we have is the same circumstance that plagues this city year after year after year, which is heavily armed offenders with extensive criminal records frequently involving prior arrests for felon in possession of a firearm or prior CCW violations, using deadly violence to resolve intracriminal disputes or using them to thwart intracriminal robberies. Now, the two children, it's dreadful. The one in a playground is just absolutely a stray round. We have no idea where it came from. Uh, the other child, unfortunately, was in a group that was fighting with another group and was uh, struck by what I believe was birdshot. Um, no excuses there. It's absurd, okay? And uh, we know who did that, and uh, I believe they're in custody, or we're seeking them actively anyway. Um, so it's the same phenomenon, and uh, we're certainly doing everything we can to disrupt the cycle, but I think we can pretty firmly state that our ability to arrest people can't be the last thing that happens to them to get them to stop doing what they're doing. Uh, the overwhelming majority of guns that we've recovered every year for the last uh, four years have been initially legally purchased. Uh, the phenomenon is either straw purchasing, where people purchase a gun for a third party knowingly for a specific third party. The other phenomenon we're seeing is people are buying numbers of firearms and selling them on the streets of Milwaukee. As you know, secondary sales don't require a background check. And so what's happening is we're seeing a very rapid turnaround between initial purchase of the gun and its use in a crime. Yeah. The ATF traces those guns for us, and it's really been quite a remarkable decrease in the time to crime between purchase and use. Is the answer better federal prosecution or more stringent federal prosecution? Well, certainly the federal government has a role to play in prosecutions, and we're working with them actively in the Violence Reduction Network on the Center Street Corridor. There's also a package of bills in the state legislature now but although they don't have local council support, I think are useful ways to target the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cycle of violence. I mean, we need to do something predictable and strong to get criminals to decide that it's better to get caught, you know, without your gun than to get caught with it, because right now they're thinking the other way around. Criminals want to have that gun because they face an uncertain but light sanction if the police catch them. But if they're caught by another criminal, they're likely to get shot. So we're losing the basis for deterrence right now. They're not deterred by arrest alone. And so I certainly support the uh, legislature looking to tighten sanctions for those who are using guns illegally. Chief, when you have weekends like this, Uh, yes, more than half of the uh, non-fatal shootings 
um, and uh, homicides were in fact arguments. Um, most of them were arguments, again, between people with pretty significant uh, criminal backgrounds, and uh, they, were, they resort to deadly violence to resolve those disputes. So that was the single driver. But even in our robberies, you know, we found out you know, one of the robbers was, uh, was a drug ripoff. Somebody had gone to buy drugs, and they were held up for their drug you know, money. Another was a circumstance where a robber tried to hold up an armed felon who killed him. So that's a technically a robbery, but the offender, the, the suspect's being, excuse me, the victim's being arrested, as well as the uh, suspect, uh, both. So that's a pretty significant set of circumstances. So you know, even our robberies, generally speaking, aren't straightforward. What we would call wholly innocent victims, and again, it's part of a criminal community that is operating with uh, more than a little impunity right now, despite the fact, as I say, that among them we've got 150 arrests. We're, we are arresting them. Uh, a lot. We're where we're supposed to be. So far this year, we've got over a hundred, excuse me, over a thousand firearms have been taken from criminals this year already. It's the most in, a, in that period of time since I've certainly been here. And uh, as you know, last year, this city seized guns at a higher rate than Chicago or New York or Los Angeles. So we're still out there. We're still doing our job. We're still locking them up. But uh, we need more follow through, I think if we're going to get uh, these individuals to stop doing what they're doing. You mentioned CCW violators as part of this weekend's violence. Can you elaborate? Well, by that I mean the people that don't have uh, a lawful right to carry a gun, so they can be locked up for carrying a concealed weapon. Particularly in the cases where there were large fights or fights between groups of people, was there any indication that anyone from these neighborhoods were, were calling police ahead of time and that maybe officers could have gotten there before it escalated to a shooting? Or is there, are you finding that there's a distrust, I guess, in some of these neighborhoods where people aren't calling the police ahead of time and it's leading to this violence? We get, we get calls. Um, sometimes these fights escalate extraordinarily rapidly. They go from argument to fists to somebody goes to the car and gets a gun within moments. Um, we were summoned to all of them. So certainly people wanted us there to do something about it. But it is a phenomenon that's very troublesome right now, and that is that, again, uh, folks out there with a sense of criminal records don't rely on the criminal justice system to resolve their issues. They rely on their gun, and that's uh, something we've got to figure out a better way to sanction. Moving into the summer, what do you want to talk about? Well, the number one thing they need to know is the vast majority of Milwaukeeans are not going to be directly in, affected by the violence because the overwhelming vast majority of Milwaukeeans aren't engaged in systematic criminal behavior. You know, I mean, I get accused of blaming victims sometimes. Well, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm describing a social phenomenon which is afflicting this city, all right, which is a large number of individuals with significant criminal records with unfettered access to firearms shooting each other and shooting innocent third parties. That's a bad thing. But the vast majority of the community is engaged in that. Our pockets of violence are generally very concentrated. The folks that come downtown to use its amenities to, you know, go to games or festivals or whatnot are perfectly safe because most of this violence, not all of it, of course, but the vast majority of it is precipitated by the activities of both the victim and the offender. And uh, people are placing themselves in harm's way once they choose a life of crime. Are the courts not doing enough once you arrest the suspect? I think the challenge with the court system is, by definition, it operates on a case-by-case -case basis. I understand the rationale. The problem is that's no strategy. And so my feeling is I don't want the courts to knee-jerk say everybody's guilty just because we've arrested them. I get they've got a different fact-finding responsibility. But I do need a more thoughtful approach across the court as to how we sanction gun offenders when gun violence is the number one problem in this city, and it's a deadly problem. There's got to be consistency there. You know, even if the, you know, a sanction isn't necessarily severe, it's got to be certain. There's got to be a certainty that if you're found guilty, something happens to you. You lose some freedom. Okay? A lot of people are upset about incarceration rates. Well, listen, that's a good debate to have about drugs. Shouldn't be a debate we have about guns. All right? Not here, not now, not at this time. And certainly it would be helpful if the uh, courts uh, could just see their way clear to open up another gun court. Uh, if we've got a thousand guns already seized, and we've already got 
you know, a couple of hundred people shot this year. We've already got 40 people murdered, 85 percent of them with firearms. I think maybe we've got a justification for another uh, another gun court. Everybody, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot, folks.